All right, so this talk is about StatsD, and I'm going to try not to screw it up because I haven't practiced it since I gave it in June. Um, slides are online if you want them um, at the URL on the bottom of the page here. So um, I'm Andrew Robin. I'm known as Hobbs on the internet. I have GitHub. I have CPAN. If you want to check out anything that I've done, I will shutter stuff. Um, the target audience for this talk, I wrote this slide when, uh, for Yapsi when people actually had a choice of which room they're in, so if you're not my target audience, I don't know, too bad you're kind of stuck with me. But um, basically the, the target audience for this is people who are developers who write, uh, who write apps that are used by the public or used by anybody and you are the person who is probably going to get called at 3 a.m. if it's broken and you don't like getting called at 3 a.m. Um, so StatsD is a system basically for looking into the insides of your app, for instrumenting things and finding out metrics. Um, it, was, uh, it was originally created by Flickr, but then adopted by Etsy, and Etsy has uh, really, really made it popular. Um, I'll also be using Graphite in this. Um, StatsD, most people use it with Graphite. It also integrates with all kinds of other things like Circonus and Logstash and has all of these different backends. But um, basically, I know, I know about Graphite, so that's what you're going to get. Um, where did these links go? Oh, right. Um, basically, these are, uh, if you want to pull up my slides and find out more about the origin of StatsD and the justification behind it, uh, there's links in here. Uh, so StatsD is a way for you to drop something into your app and find out what is going on. Uh, how, when do things happen? How often, you know, how many times a second or how many times a day do people uh, use this feature? How long does it take to generate a page? How many queries am I sending to the database? Um, and more, more importantly, um, how have things changed? What's going on? What's going on right now? And like, has it always been that way? Has it gone up? Has it gone down? Did it change when we do this deploy? Um, all of those things are things that you really need to know sometimes if you're trying to make an app run reliable. Um, so it's a little bit of it's a little bit of real time. It's a little bit of historical. Um, it's semi real time in that you can generally uh, see data up to like ten or thirty seconds old. Um, so this is this is an example of a graph that you might get out of StatsD and Graphite. Um, so this is like latency of some kind of search request on our uh, search service at Shutterstock. Um, and you see that StatsD automatically is doing percentiles for you. So like 90% of the requests are, sorry, 80% of the requests are down here and they take like 20 milliseconds or something. And then 98% of the time we do it within a second and then there's these like 2% of queries that are really badly made. Um, so you get you get a nice graph of that, right? Um, and this is this is also coming from our search service, and uh, the uh, the sources have been sources of searches have been renamed to protect the innocent. But you can see, like, all right, what is what is sending calls to our service? Um, and this is all information that you can see live and historical. Um, so the way that StatsD works is um, it accepts stuff using UDP from anywhere on your network, which is, which is nice. It means that if you have a piece of code running anywhere, all it needs to do is send a packet to StatsD, and eventually it will get tracked, and it will end up on a graph somewhere. Um, so it accepts all these measurements, it aggregates them into 10-second chunks, and then it sends them off to a data store. StatsD is actually just ephemeral. All it does is it collects data for 10 seconds at a time and sends it somewhere else. So Graphite in this case is actually the data store that makes graphs and things and, excuse me, goodness. Um, so the different kinds of data types that StatsD has are, counters are one of the really big ones, which is basically something happened. I want to count how many times does this happen. Um, and you can get, um, you know, how many times data happened in the last 10 seconds, in the last minute, in the 
recognize that in any pattern. Um, timers are the other one. I just did something, it took this long, I'm going to send that information, and now I can find out how long does it take on average or percentile for the lowest or the highest or whatever. Um, the less used data types that it has are sets and gauges. Sets are good um, for something where you want to count the, uh, the number of times that something happened, or the number of unique things. Um, so for example, you might be able to send a set where um, the event is a user viewed a page, and what you pass as the value to the set is the username. Um, so then it will count how many different users hit the page in the aggregation period. Um, you don't have to you don't have to do counting there, you just say user user Hobbs hit the page, user R Jeffrey hit the page, and it's going to say, alright, I've seen two different unique things. Um, and gauges are for sort of um, slow moving things. Um, you might have a percentage completion or a percentage of disk usage or something like that. Um, if you put it in a timer, you would be implying a unit of milliseconds and you would get all of this percentile stuff that you're not interested in. If you put it in a counter, then if you sent the same, uh, same value twice in the same time period, it would say, oh, well, I'm going to multiply that by two because you sent it twice. Um, so gauges simply take the last value that you sent to put on the graph. It's basically, if you're using Graphite, it's almost like sending the, same, sending the data directly uh, into Graphite, ignoring static data. Um, so, all right, you want to get started with this. Um, you need to set it up somewhere. Installing StatsD is really easy, assuming that you have Node somewhere. npm install StatsD, uh, edit the default config file. You actually barely even need to edit it. Um, StatsD config.js, you're up and running. It's accepting data on one port, and it's writing to Graphite on another port. If you're editing the config file, it's probably to tell it where the Graphite server is. Installing Graphite is uh, considerably more fun. Uh, it has, it's broken up into all of these components, um, and it's a Python thing, and it depends on uh, Apache modules, I found out you can't actually run it under like uWSGI instead of uh, instead of the Apache module, but that's even less documented. There is no packages for it for any distribution that I've found, uh, and it's it's kind of uh, unpleasant. Um, so the route that I ended up going was um, Chef. There's a Chef recipe that will install Graphite for you with all of the components that it needs. Um, you can get Chef for, uh, for Unix systems, for Windows, for Mac OS, um, and if you don't have Chef infrastructure, you don't have a Chef server anywhere, like, you don't have to worry about that. Chef solo, give it a config file, you tell it, make my system like this, it'll make your system like this, now you have, now you have Graphite. Um, if you are interested, there's a link in my slides to, um, to the specific chef cookbook that I use. Um, so I was talking to one of the one of the ops guys at work about, all right, this is this is how I did this for for my demo for my talk, and he said, yeah, that's cool, but you know what I just heard recently is that there's also a uh, Docker file for this. So if you're if you're running Linux and you like the sound of containers and you want uh, you want something that is contained, but not a virtual machine, but it also doesn't like, you know, overwrite your whole system. Um, you can check out, you can check out Docker. There's a couple different, uh, there's a Doc Cloud approved one, which they've actually written a blog post about. And one of my coworkers, uh, Silas Sewell, has also written one that installs both Graphite and Statsd into a Docker container. And you just run it and like it outputs, you run Docker PS, it outputs some port numbers and it's like great. Right, Port numbers that you have to use to pop and stuff. Um, so that's the solution of, all right, uh, it's kind of a pain to install Graphite. So the way, um, the way that StatsD actually goes into your code, it's push-based. Like I said, you're just sending UDP packets 
uh, to a server somewhere. There's clients for pretty much every language you would ever want to write code in. Um, obviously, I'm going to focus on the Perl ones. NetStatsV is the sort of original. NetStatsV client is one that I've written and that I'm going to talk about in this uh, talk a little bit. They're both on CPAN. Um, so this is the vanilla way to uh, use NetStatsV. No objects, no nothing. There's a global variable that says, like, this is the StatsV server that I'm going to send off to. So initialize that somewhere in your app. And then when you do something, like, you want to increment a counter, so call NetStatsV increment. Um, metrics are just basically uh, strings of alphanumeric stuff, and you can have, like, dashes little bit of punctuation in there, and their namespace by dot. Think of dot as being the slash in uh, uh, a file path because that's actually the way it's stored on this. So you're saying in this, whenever somebody logs into my app, increment logins, and poof, that will be on your track. With, uh, with NetStats v client, a little bit more, a little bit more upfront, you get an object that you can call stats or call whatever you want. Um, it gives you a chance to set a prefix because um, if you're going, if you're being good about namespacing stuff, then like all of your stuff that belongs to one app, you probably want to put under one hierarchy in your stats feed. Um, but it's bad to repeat that stuff all the time, right? So put it in your config. If you have a dancer app or any other kind of app, like you can put this, put your config for NetStats V client into your app config so that it gets wired up and you never have to think about it again. Um, and then, so now when you get a login, you just want to call increment on your stats feed, on your stats object, and all you have to do is tell it logins because my app dot is assumed it's in your prefix. This is kind of the reason why I wrote NetStats V client. This is how you do timings. Um, Set your, set your global variable for where your server is, use time high res, import a couple functions. Now I have a function that is going to get some stuff. See, it says right here, get some stuff. Um, but so in order to time that, before I do that, I have to call get time of day, wrap it in an array reference, store it in a variable, and then after I get it, call TV interval, store that in a variable, Remember to multiply it by a thousand because TV interval gives you seconds, but stats is in a unit of, of milliseconds, uh, and then and then round it down and then call net stats D timing with that variable and the metric name that I want, and then go back to what I was doing originally. Net stats D client gives you timer objects, which are pretty nice. Um, so you create a timer object, you tell it what um, Create your stats v object just like we did in the previous slide. Create a timer object from it. That creates an object that is going to send the timing back from the server. The timer starts when you create the timer object, and it finishes when you call finish on it. Uh, so there's less boilerplate code here, and it's just nicer if you want to sprinkle timings in, uh, into some code. Um, and a timer object will warn if it goes out of scope and you didn't call finish or cancel on it. Cancel means like, oh, something bad happened and I don't actually care about this timer anymore. And the reason it does that is because you might have different code paths and you might forget to call finish in one of them. Um, so now silently you have a code path that isn't getting timed and it isn't contributing to your times. I want you to know about that. So if you don't actually tell your timer when it's like, if it goes out of scope, but you didn't actually tell it it was finished, you're gonna get a warning. I think it's, I think it's a good thing. Um, StatsD supports sampling, which is pretty cool. Um, if you have a whole lot of events and you don't want to send 30 million packets per second to your server, you can just specify a sample rate. Um, and this is an example of how you do it with the actual code. Um, for timers, there's not really a difference if you sample, right? There's just less data, but the average is still the average, the 90th percentile is still the 90th percentile, the, the, the max and the min, et cetera. For counters, if you specify a sample rate, 
StatSD sends that sample rate along to the server. So if you say that I am sending 1% of the 1% of the events only to the server, then every time the server gets an event, it'll multiply that by 100. It's saying there was only a 1% chance of this event getting through. So if I got a packet, then on average that means that this thing actually happened 100 times. So you don't have to uh, you don't have to do any math in your graphs to decode what's going on. You don't have to worry about the fact that different data sources might have different sample rates. It's just going to do it for you. That's pretty cool. Um, so uh, this is a slide that I hastily added yesterday. But um, the main thing that I think is missing from that NetStats client right now is actually more goodness with timing. Um, I, in the past, had done some stuff like this uh, in Catalyst using the Catalyst stats object, which gives you uh, sort, of a, sort of a profiler object where you can say begin doing this thing, end doing this thing, and checkpoints in between as you, as you hit different subtasks. And then at the end, it gives you a text table of the amount of time spent with the different stuff and uh, uh, with the uh, indentation for subtasks and all of that stuff. And I want to get a, a little bit of that into NetStats stats to be fine. I've started uh, started doing that with uh, something that I something that I have for work, but it's not it's not ready for release yet, so that's not quite there. Um, I wanted to show off a cool a few cool tricks that you can do with Graphite um, to make these stats more useful. Um, Draw is infinite, it's cool. Draw is infinite says any time that there is no value, then there's nothing drawn. But if there is a value, then it's going to draw from the bottom, from the bottom to the top of the screen. Um, so if you use draw is infinite uh, myapp.deploy, then and you send in your deploy code, you send a deploy event every time you actually push out code then you'll get a vertical line on your graph every time you push code as a marker so that you can see if things change. Um, if you use draw as infinite and remove the low value and put a little bit of transparency in there and put it on an area graph, then you can highlight when things are bad. Instead of having to look at a line and be like, yeah, this is over the limit, you can get a highlight. Um, and Graphite has functions highest average, lowest average, highest current, lowest current. Uh, that will uh, basically take a whole list of metrics. Maybe you have a hundred different machines and they're all sending data in their five watt machine name. And you want to see like which ones are misbehaving. Is it running slow or on some of these? If you say five highest average, then it will take that list of a hundred and instead of plotting a hundred lines on the graph, it will plot five lines on the graph. And then in legend, you'll get the host names of the ones that are higher than all the rest. Um, so this is this is a, an example again from reality of something that you can do with the, with the draw is infinite remove below value. So downloads are failing. Basically, it has an alpha so that it draws transparent on top of everything else. And if this uh, if this failure goes above like one percent of things are failing, then the whole the whole graph gets highlighted red. Right? So you can see like that. Ah, ah, be be afraid. Um, so, this is just the bit where I show you uh, something useful that you can do. As soon as I remember how to use my computer, mouse over here. I don't know if you I like those words. Cool. So I wrote an app using WebSimple. There we go. I wrote an app using WebSimple that uh, basically every time every time you hit it, it does some very hard work called sleeping for a random amount of time. Um, and every time you hit it, it increments a counter in StatsD and it times how long it actually took to sleep. Um, and so anybody who has a device in here and wants to screw with this thing, uh, that's my IP address right there. And 
and I am running on port 5000. So if you want to, if you want to try hitting, oh, somebody, there we go, somebody's using it. Seven four. This multi multi monitor thing is messing with me a little bit, but there we go. I think I can figure out how to use my own computer. Oh, there we go. That uh, is somebody hitting the page. Eventually, we'll solve that problem. There's my cursor. I lost that. Oh. Ah, there we go. Getting 30, 40 some hits a second now. Um, and so you can see, I did, I did a random sleep of like zero to a thousand milliseconds. And it turns out that the average is out to 500, and the 90th percentile is 900, which means math works. Cool. Um, so that's that's basically that's basically all I wanted to show, and I really just wanted to emphasize how easy it is to drop into your app. All you have to do is tell it what host name to send to, and add a call. If you want to count something, you say count this thing. If you want to time something, you say count this th uh, time this thing. You give it a name, there will be a graph here. Making the graph look pretty takes a little bit of uh, a little bit of mojo, um, but that's it. It's just it's just really wonderful, um, and the StatsD server um, is tiny, takes up almost no memory at all, and can handle like tens of thousands of requests a second without having kind of trouble. Um, it's written in Node. If that doesn't do it for you, there's also a C version. They actually perform pretty similar. Yeah. I have a comment and a question. Um, comment is, I do, I have did find that in my repository on Debian. Really? Yes. Yeah, Wonder if that is, is it that graphite or is it just a different thing? Yeah, it's um, graphite carbon. Yeah, it's just a yeah. Awesome. Maybe older, but yes, I can find a repository. And the second question is um, Does this um, thing you said have um, support as an MP secondary protocol? Does that be useful for you? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, there's, there's there's a lot of different backends for it, and it's it's possible that there's one that will actually output SN, SNMP traps, but I've never used that. Thank you. Anyone else? Cool. Thank you.